Welcome to the last um, video for chapter 3 and the last video in what we would consider module 1 where we're going to talk about Newton's law of gravity and some of the um, extra topics that go along with it. So it's the second half of chapter 3. We have skipped over talking about section 3.2 in this particular lecture format. It's not a key part of the curriculum that I am um, recording these for. Now when we talk about Isaac Newton um, in this section Modern astronomy had had a hundred years to start building up um, a better foundation. So Isaac Newton comes onto the scene a hundred years after um, Nicholas Copernicus publishes his initial idea that maybe the Greeks were wrong and the sun is actually at the center of the solar system. And so Isaac Newton had all of this work to be able to build off of and what he really contributed was a physical interpretation, the why, behind the mathematical understanding that the people before him already had. They knew the what, Isaac Newton is providing the why. Now, Isaac Newton developed many different things, including the section of the textbook that we skipped over, but the one that we're gonna focus on is an equation that is the single most important equation for our introduct introductory astronomy um, understanding. It's the universal law of gravitation it's a fairly short looking equation on the right here that basically tells us that if we have two masses separated by a certain distance, there is a force pulling them towards each other. That force of gravity is based on the two masses and on the distance between them. And when people talk about the acceleration of gravity, they are talking about if we think about a single large object like the Earth, then the large M here would be the Earth mass, and the R here would be the radius of the Earth, which means that the only thing that we have to change is the small mass, and all of the other numbers will be the same as each other. And that's why in one of the videos that we had linked in the chapter two slides, um, that on the moon, if we dropped a hammer and a feather, they will drop at the same rate. And in a vacuum chamber here on Earth, when there's no air for that feather to um, be slowed down by, they will drop at the same rate. That comes from this understanding as well. Now the only requirement for gravity to act on this, um, to act on any objects is for there to be two separate objects and their separation matters. Now in this particular diagram that I have, um, G is out front of everything. It can also commonly be written on top of the fraction and it means the same thing. In this slide we have capital D for distance. In most textbooks the lowercase r represents the same idea, the distance, which is why at the very bottom we have this same idea kind of written out in words. The force of gravity is equal to this gravitational constant. It's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 in standard units. We don't need that number, don't write it down. The two masses get multiplied together, and then the distance um, is on the bottom, which means that as we make the distance bigger, gravity gets weaker and weaker. And because the distance is squared, it gets weaker by a um, much bigger change than anything else would be. I will have a separate video in the playlist here, wherever we're watching this, um, where I'm on a light board and I go through the details of all of this. So I do want us to understand that this lecture video is going to be a little bit shorter and kind of skimp on some of the details because we're going to have me at a actual um, light board be able to talk through things in a, in a different way. But something that we can use to help test our understanding is a pause and think question. So which of the following would cause the force on the moon by the earth to increase by the largest amount? As always, Pause the video, read through the question and the options, and choose what you think is the best answer and kind of have an explanation for yourself. Okay. So the key thing here is there are two big takeaways from this. If we are ignoring this new equation that we introduced, then we can kind of convince ourselves that doubling the mass of the moon or the earth is somehow more important than the other. But if we go back a um, slide here, if we make the large M twice as big or the small M twice as big, it has the same overall effect. 
2 times the mass times the mass. So option 1 and option 2 here both double the force of gravity, which means that neither of them can be our correct answer if they're both doing the same thing. And then option four is also ruled out if we realize that since mass matters, changing it would be a problem here. And so it's option three, moving the moon two times closer to Earth. What we're basically saying in that, and it's kind of worded strangely, I'm sorry for that, is that there's a distance and we're going to take half the distance. We're going to move it twice as, as close as it was. The reason why that causes a bigger change is because that distance in the bottom is squared. When we move the moon closer, it doesn't just double the force, it will multiply the force by a factor of four. So like I said, we'll have a follow-up video where we'll go through a very similar uh, question and a similar set of options, and we'll see, we'll plug in that kind of thing into the equation and, and kind of see it for ourselves. But the important thing to note here is that the distance always matters more than a change to the mass, and this would be exactly the same answer if we were asking about the force on the Earth by the moon. The force of gravity is a single number when there's two objects involved, no matter which one is the bigger mass. It's kind of like two different um, groups on the end of a rope for tug of war. There's a single force within that rope, um, no matter which group is really winning out, otherwise that rope would break. Um, and so the force of gravity that the moon feels from us and the force of gravity that we feel from the moon is the same number value force and that's worth being aware of as well. Now the reason why gravity is so important in this particular portion of the um, semester is because we're going to be talking about things orbiting all throughout um, the semester. Stars orbiting each other, planets going around stars, and so we need to understand that the only reason why things are able to orbit is because there is absolutely still gravity in space. There's a strong force of gravity in orbit around the Earth. And the fact that the Earth is going around the Sun is because of the force of gravity, a strong force of gravity. It's a common misconception that in orbit we are weightless. That is not the case. We are actually falling and if we see, um, see video of astronauts floating around in a space shuttle or the International Space Station, it just means that they're falling in the same way as the International Space Station, in the same way that those free fall drop rides at amusement parks, you kind of feel weightless for that short amount of time where you're in free fall. Now, to be able to orbit, you have to be going at just the right speed. If you go too slow, you'll fall back down to, um, to Earth. If you go too fast, you don't complete an orbit, you just go out into space. That's how we get um, spacecraft sent to Jupiter or sent to Pluto or beyond. We make them go really, really fast. The just right speed that allows a um, closed orbit, the perfect circular um, orbit speed for Earth is 17,500 miles per hour. So I can't achieve that in my car. That's why we use rockets. Um, and it's an extremely, extremely high speed because there's a really strong force of gravity on the Earth and we have to get it to be able to go um, fast enough sideways so that it's falling um, around the Earth instead of into the Earth. Now Newton's laws um, of motion and his universal law of gravitation were all published in 1688 and it helps us understand why Kepler saw what he did with his planetary motion. The reason why planets move faster when they're close to the sun is because the force of gravity is stronger. The reason why they move slower when they're far from the sun is because the force of gravity is weaker. These laws now kind of represent the culmination of a hundred years of work from the initial idea by Nicholas Copernicus that the solar system could function if the sun were at the center to Isaac Newton telling us the solar system has to function with the sun at the center because it's a huge amount of mass and so everything is in orbit around it um, because of this strong force of gravity between the planets and the sun. Now any uh, scientific idea is put to the test by making a prediction and seeing if it comes true. And so a couple uh, quick stories that I want to tell us that really hit home the importance of um, the law of gravity and how, how useful it is. 
The first one is Edmund Halley when he tracked the orbit of a comet. He was able to predict by following how the comet moved through the inner solar system, he was able to predict exactly how long it would take for the comet to show back up in a particular location. Now, he predicted this ahead of time. The comet, Halley's Comet, takes 76 years to complete a full orbit, a very, very stretched out elliptical orbit. He was right, Edmund Halley was right within a 24 hour period. So this is a huge win for the process of science and the predictions being able to be made by Newton's law of gravity. The other story that I'll end us with here is um, not the discovery of the planet Uranus, but the discovery of the planet Neptune. Because Uranus was discovered kind of on accident. We mentioned back in um, the Copernicus section of this module that uh, the ancient Greeks and even Copernicus uh, only knew about six planets in our solar system. That's because Uranus is too dim to be able to be seen with the human eye, and we need a um, telescope to see it. William Herschel had a lot of really powerful telescopes in the 1700s, and he discovered it on accident, just kind of like looking at all of the sky all of the time and recognizing that there was this point that was moving relative to the stars. Even the word planet comes from the Greek for wanderer. The reason we know that they're not stars is because they move relative to the stars themselves. However, as people tracked that planet, it didn't quite fit with Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravity. So we had a conundrum. We either have a hypothesis that now is proven false and has to be thrown out, or there is something that we're missing in the observation. Now, astronomers weren't willing to throw out 100 years of work, and so instead they're like, okay, the way that Uranus is behaving would be consistent with another, even more distant planet that is close-ish to it and is able to have its own gravitational pull, kind of pulling it forward and faster in its orbit or uh, backwards and slower in its orbit, depending on where Uranus and Neptune were. And so several groups went out searching for it. And in 1845, two separate groups um, were were able to discover it exactly where it was supposed to be. The slide says less than one degree away. Um, degrees as angles on the sky or how astronomers talk about things relative to each other. From one horizon to the other horizon is 180 degrees. And so one degree is a very small um, error to have with something as fundamental as um, predicting where a planet should be. At this point in our solar system, Newton, uh, Neptune is actually the only planet that was predicted to exist before we found it. Everything else was just kind of um, noticing it was there. So all of Newton's laws are testable and verifiable. And so I'll end this um, particular lecture video and this particular module with a quote from um, Isaac Newton to help remind us of all of the people that came before him. If I have seen farther than other men, it is because I stood upon the shoulders of giants. So those giants that he was talking about were um, Galileo and Copernicus and Tycho Brahe and Kepler and all of these other names that didn't make it into our small slide set. And so we want to make sure that we understand not memorizing names for the sake of memorizing them, but recognizing that it took a long time to be able to figure out how things move in our solar system. But from the um, 1600s, 1700s on, we've got it pretty well understood. And so we can start to learn about other topics as we go through this whole semester. Once we figured out the solar system, we can start to figure out everything else. So I will see you in the next module. Uh, thanks for watching and um, have a good one.